it seems that this concert has um, dark overtones, but but really, you know, people, when it comes to it, it is a change in life. As uh, Lyle Lovett likes to say, it's a fact of life no one cares to mention. <laughs> um, but uh, talk about putting together this program and, and uh, you know, bringing your transmigration of souls to Cincinnati for the first time is really exciting for us. Well, I think the concert is actually a journey from darkness to light. Um, it, it begins with uh, a young man's um, rather glamorous and flamboyant uh, description of, of death and the transfiguration of the soul, that, that young man being Richard Strauss, who wrote this piece when he was in his mid-twenties or so, and uh, it's, it's, it's an evocative piece. Um, it's one of his extremely virtuoso, brilliant uh, tone poems like Ein Helden Leben and Zarathustra. I put it on the program largely um, to sort of be a counterpoise against my piece, which is called the, On the Transmigration of Souls. Uh, my piece, in a sense, is, is far less flamboyant. Um, it's much darker and, and much more, and in a sense, much more poignant. Um, I was asked by the New York Philharmonic at the end of 2001 if I'd be willing to compose a work to commemorate the first anniversary of um, the World Trade Center attacks. That concert would be in September 2002, and the original program that Lauren Mazel had, had designed had the Stravinsky Symphony of Psalms uh, followed by the Beethoven Ninth, and they said, well, will give you the forces of the Stravinsky Symphony of Psalms, chorus and orchestra. I didn't really want this commission. Um, you know, I, I felt that 9-11 uh, had been so overexposed that the media had used it over and over and over. Uh, I think at first in, in genuine desire uh, to report, and then I think it became a marketing issue after a while, and the country seemed to go into a sort of orgy of of um, you know repeating these images. On the other hand, I felt that the New York Philharmonic, being in a certain sense our our flagship orchestra, being in New York with its great history, um, asking me as an American composer to write something. This this was not something I should just simply say no to. I I needed to find a way to say yes. So I spent about two months um, surfing the internet reading everything I could about um, not the political aspects of 9-11, but about the personal aspects. And I found all sorts of things. I found personal um, memories. I found certain sites on the internet where people could go and, and, and write a little memorial to, to someone who died. A friend of mine had been down at uh, Ground Zero, and she'd taken photos of the uh, uh, the little missing person signs that family members had put up surrounding uh, you know, the area where the buildings came down. And I found little phrases from those signs. Maybe it was just a description, you know, black hair, brown eyes, 150 pounds, silver chain around his neck, we love you. Uh, very touching things. Uh, little verbal images that are like, like fractals, they're so small, and yet because we know what this is about, we, we uh, we immediately understand. And I put this all together in a kind of a strange libretto and set it for children's voices, adult chorus, orchestra, huge orchestra, and, uh, and a taped uh, spoken soundtrack with city noises and uh, sirens in the distance and, and people talking uh, which surrounds the audience. You said you didn't want to just because of the commercialization of 9-11. I mean, it, it's such a, <clears throat> was such a soul-wrenching event. Um, and there have been artists who reacted to it, some who shut down and did not want to react to it. Um, but, but it was mainly the commercialization that you, you, as, you as an artist didn't have that type of creative response to it until asked. Well, not exactly. I, I mean, I have taken themes from contemporary life. Um, I mean, I, I view that as, as the, 
you know, that's the, the, the fertile soil from which a lot of my music um, grows. Certainly Nixon in China, the opera that was done here in Cincinnati last summer, you know, it's an opera about very familiar events and familiar people, but it's also an opera that has a great mythic theme of our time, you know, the collision of communism and capitalism. Um, my second opera, The Death of Klinghoffer, is about a terrorist event uh, that involved Americans and in, in, uh, caught up in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. My most recent opera, Dr. Atomic, is uh, you know about J. Robert Oppenheimer and the, and the creation of the atomic bomb. So I'm very comfortable in these, in these uh, sort of archetypical American historical events. I just felt that, first of all, it was so close to the event. I mean, I would have to be writing this piece within six months of the event. And yes, I did. I, 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 commercialization is not exactly the right word, but I... Uh, the writer Philip Roth, the great American novelist, had said that he felt that there was a genuine pour outpouring of emotion and grief and shock in, in the month or so. And then after that, the country kind of turned into a, an orgy of narcissism. Um, you know, it was a terrible event, but, I mean, we as Americans have perpetrated much worse on other countries. Um, when people go to war, they kill not in the, in the thousands, but in the hundreds of thousands and even in the millions. Uh, but Americans seem to think that what happened to them on September 11th was somehow more important and more shocking um, than the deaths that happened to people elsewhere in the world. So I had, I had very, very conflicted feelings about it. That's why I chose to focus on the individual family members, the mother that lost a son, the young girl who lost her fiance, the father who lost a daughter. I mean, these incredibly, profoundly wrenching um, emotional events that are so tiny and that we just, we don't think about. Do you think the piece would have been different if, like Nixon in China and Dr. Atomic, that you, you had the, the, the lens of time to, to, to look through? Do you, do you feel it, it might have been different having had more time than just six months after the event, and, you know, to let it set in the cultural consciousness. I couldn't possibly know that. I mean, I, I'm pleased with what I did. I, I did a piece that's largely very reflective. Um, people ask me what it was. You know, is it a requiem? No. Is it a, a choral symphony? No. Um, is it an oratorio? No. Um, I, I came up with the word uh, memory space. Um, you know, occasionally when I'm in Europe, I'll go into those great uh, Gothic cathedrals like Notre Dame or Chartres in France, and you go into this very vast uh, religious space, and people are very quiet, and you realize you're in the presence of not only the living people that are there, but the the ghosts, the souls of all the people that have been there in the past. This kind of spiritual memory space, and I wanted to create a a musical uh, analogy of that. So largely the piece is very quiet and reflective, but there are two huge explosions in it. One very brief and very unsettling, and then this massive surge, a kind of tsunami of, of brass and strings uh, that peaks with the chorus, just literally shouting over and over again, light, 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 light. Um, it's not it's not joyous. It's almost a panic. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what I'm saying. I'm just, I know that when the event happened, it was so shocking. We don't know what our emotions were, but there's always this desire to transcend um, horror and, and, and look for something comforting. And I think that's the sense you get at this, at this, at this enormous uh, orchestral and choral climax of the piece.